All right, all right, all right. Here we go. We're talking 10, 10, 5, 10, 6, 10, 7, and 15, 2. We're talking about basically uh, agriculture, like GMOs and that organic food. We're also going to talk about water, freshwater depletion. All right, so genetically modified food. So there's obviously the thing called the GMOs, which I'm confident everybody has heard of. Okay, so two different things that I want to point out there. Genetically modified foods versus genetically modified organisms. Okay, so just to kind of differentiate between the two of them. And I'm going to write them on the first sticky note on page 250 here. So genetically modified foods come from genetically modified organisms. So when we talk about like, oh, I'm eating GMOs, well, you're more eating GMFs, technically. So, but GMO is the more uh, common vernacular. So genetically modified foods come from genetically modified organisms. And genetic engineering is different because it combines DNA from much different species. So, for example, this picture on the right here, you can see it starts, starts at the top. I'm actually going to zoom out so you can see everything all at the same time. Oh, going the wrong way. All right, so we got the bacteria cell. We got the cell from another organism. Okay, basically you combine everything together, the recombinant DNA, and now you got basically a completely new thing. So basically you're adding in some stuff to make it a different type of food or make it the genetically modified foods. Okay, a lot of things that they do is they do things that are called, um, like they're, uh, uh, they're resistant to insects is one of the popular ones. A thing called BT cotton and BT corn, which on the next table over here talks about it. Like you can see the BT cotton right there. And then the BT uh, corn is right there. Okay, basically what that BT is, you can see it says that it kills insects. And that's basically the thing, so you don't need to put as much pesticide on it is what it is. And that's why they're doing that stuff, to basically make it so they're more resistant to getting eaten by other things. All right, so moving on 252. The genetically modified crops are everywhere. As much as people want to try and avoid them, it's almost impossible. Like 70% of the processed food in the United States contains some sort of genetically modified ingredients, okay, which everybody thinks is a horrendous thing, which we don't have the long-term studies just yet, but so far we actually haven't been able to figure out that they're really bad for us yet. So they're great potential, but they're not necessarily profitable because it takes a lot of money to do that stuff. That's basically the reason behind it. Now on 253 here, the increased use of genetically modified crops has caused a decline in insecticide use, but an increase in herbicide use. So that's a big difference between them, okay? Insecticide, like the name implies, is taking care of insects, you know, the flies and the grasshoppers and things like that. Whereas herbicides, like if you think if you're gonna be growing herbs, you're growing plants, think of herbicide as like taking care of like the weeds around the crop. That's the stuff that they're using more of. So they're not necessarily killing off the things, the other insects. They're now trying to kill off all the weeds that are growing around it. So less insect killing, more weed killing is basically what they're talking about there. All right. So one of the big things that everybody talks about is G are GM crops bad? And that's the science behind the story thing that they're talking about here. Are they, are they bad? Eh, well, maybe kind of a thing. And it kind of talks about, we just simply haven't been able to really study them for long enough for us to really know for sure, for certain, which, which one it is, if it's good or if it's bad. One of the things I want to point out here is this precautionary principle. The idea that one should not undertake a new action until its ramifications are well understood. And so that's what I was talking about actually today with that kind of that, you know, that uh, skeptical optimism you know, like, it's a good thing. It can be a really good thing, but just be wary of it. Okay, moving on page 260, or excuse me, 256. So, money controls politics. And I'm confident you guys know this already, but this is a really good example in the sense of good, meaning it points it out, but actually a terrible example as well. So I'm going to read this paragraph here. So in 2013, biotech companies agreed to gain even more power, or excuse me, appeared to gain even more power when a rider in a budget bill, a rider is like the little kind of fine text that kind of gets put along into bills these days. 
So when a rider in a budget bill passed by the U.S. Senate stripped courts of the ability to revoke USDA approval of any GM crop found to be unsafe, which is terrible because if we find it to be unsafe, courts can't do anything now. And that's really, really terrible. So it's dubbed the Montesano Protection Act. And this Montesano, they, they were the guys, kind of the first guys to really take this GM stuff to the extreme. So the Montesano Protection Act by its critics, it inspired a groundswell of opposition from food safety advocates and citizens who viewed it as a violation of the government's system of checks and balances. The provision expired after six months, thankfully. So basically what they're saying is they were freaking out because the government is supposed to protect the people, but now they're dropping that. So next I talk about organic farmers may get hurt from GM crops blowing into their fields, and then they can be sued for the same reason, which is even worse. Uh, where is he here? The Go down just a little bit. Um, uh, 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 this first came to light in Canada, so on, so on, so on. Uh, where's it talking about? Uh, when Schmeiser, who is the organic farmer, harvested his seed and replanted it the next year, many of the plants that grew contained Montesano's patented herbicide tolerance genes because that stuff had blown into his farm. Montesano sued him, and the court sided with Montesano, Montesanto, excuse me, ordering the farmer to pay the corporation $238,000. So this quote up here, I think is really good. Farmers are being sued for having GMOs on their property that they did not buy, do not want, will not use, and cannot sell. Which is just a terrible situation for those farmers to be in. So the US actually doesn't require the labeling of food. So when you go to the store, it's not required for them to tell you, yes, this is GMO kind of food, or yes, this is organic. They, the organic people want you to know that, so they put that on there, but they're actually not required to do that. And so this, again, goes back to consumers having all of the information, talking about that neoclassical economics. We don't have all of the information, unfortunately, which makes it so the economics doesn't really work out very well. All right, so now we're moving on to organic agriculture. And we talked about this a little bit the other day, talking about like they still use pesticides. Um, so you can see a whole bunch of different things here, kind of like the criteria they have to meet. Uh, where is it? The most conventional pesticides are prohibited. Pests, weeds, and diseases should be managed with biocontrol, mechanical practices, and approved synthetic substances. So they can still use pesticides, but they have to be approved beforehand. They also, which I like, they aren't allowed to use uh, synthetic fertilizer. So they only use the crop rotation, cover crops, animal or crop waste or other approved synthetic materials are allowed. So I like the fact that this is basically Biggest Little Farm is what we're talking about happening there, thankfully. All right, now this science behind the story, I like this one because they're talking about how productive is organic farming and kind of against the conventional farming. And this chart, I even have a little sticky note there, this chart summarizes organic farming really well. So you can see the organic is in red, the conventional is in kind of the orange color. Okay, the last two I think are really impressive. Okay, energy input, you can see there's a lot more energy needed to be put into the conventional farming compared to the organic. Then the greenhouse gases, there's more for the conventional than for the greenhouse gases, which I, I like a lot. Kind of, this is kind of start, some of the stuff that's talking about how organic agriculture is thankfully kind of starting to catch on. And then we were just talking, we watched Dirt the Movie, Look at the dirt difference. How kind of dark and rich that that is, whereas that look is basically looking like it's getting stripped of stuff, getting stripped of its nutrients. Alrighty, so this basically talks about organic agriculture is on the rise. You can see some charts here that's talking about, um, you can see like the certified or uh, operations cropland pasture. So we can see basically it's starting to increase luckily. Now the big question though, this is on page 261, can organic agriculture feed the world? Not yet. We are getting there, but not yet. And basically the organic yields about 80% of the conventional farming, 
because because of that GM stuff, you basically they have made crops grow faster, so they can get two harvests instead of just one. All right, next we're moving on to sustainable food production. So I didn't have any, I don't have any notes on the next two pages, 262 and 263, because this is basically, think back to Dirt, the movie. They talked about these. They talked about the farmer's markets. They also talked about these community-supported agriculture. You know, so like you pay a monthly fee or a yearly fee or whatever it is to have access to their food. There's also, they talk about sustainable agriculture. There's a really good diagram over here how this kind of rice has been used to kind of demonstrate how sustainable agriculture has worked in the past and is still currently working. You can see the rice there, fertilizes it with the waste, nitrogen goes in there. You can see how it all kind of fits together so everything works and everything is sustainable, thankfully. All right, so now we gotta jump to 15.2, okay? 15.2 is uh, solutions to depletion of fresh water. I'm on page 402. So, solution to depletion of fresh water. So we got increased supply or we got to reduce the demand. Those are basically our two options is what we got to do. Those are our only options. We either somehow find more fresh water or we make it so we don't need it as much. Both of them are very difficult. Obviously, not good in the long run. Because basically then we're just like tapping into deeper and deeper and deeper aquifers. You know, basically sucking the world literally dry. Then re reduce demand. It's obviously difficult to put into perspective, into practice. Because, you know, like, uh, hey, you need to drink less water. Well, but I've been told my whole life I need to drink more water. You know, that kind of stuff. You need to water your lawn less. Well, then my water's going to, or my lawn's going to turn brown. You know, it's just, it's just kind of a difficult thing to put into practice because we've been trained the, the wrong way for so long. Desalinization. That is one way to increase our supply. However, that process, I even spelled it wrong. Desal that should say desalinization, which is, oh, no, I did spell it wrong, desalination. Okay, um, that's basically removing salt for, to make fresh water, which unfortunately is very expensive. So it's really hard. And that's what I wrote on the next, the next sticky note, you can see 403. Desalination is very expensive. It uses fossil fuels. It kills marine life at the intakes and it generates salty waste, a thing called brine. And basically brine is basically you're basically taking the salt from one body of water and just basically taking all the salt out and throwing it in another body of water. So it's making it more salty somewhere else. We can also reduce the demand like we were talking about. So that we could change the agricultural demand by installing the drip irrigation, which we've talked about. That basically then the water isn't lost to evaporation. The water isn't lost to just overrunning. You basically you're drip taking it right straight down to the roots, thankfully. Residential solutions. Rainwater harvesting. Or basically, I'm not sure if you've ever seen those big rain buckets. That can be one thing. So you're not basically taking the city's water. You're just grabbing from your own rain buckets that's rained on your house and on your property and reusing that water. Okay, there's also a thing called gray water irrigation. Now what gray water is... Think of this as like, this is what comes out of your, like um, the drain from your sink, the drain from your dishwasher, the drain from your bathtub and your shower, that's gray water. So it's not potable, potable meaning drinkable. So you can't drink it, but you can still use it for irrigation as well. So there's also this thing called exerscaping. This is basically in the kind of a picture down there, kind of a better way than I'm ever gonna explain it without that. Basically, think of like desert landscaping. You're getting things or plants that are drought resistant or don't need as much water. So like in Las Vegas, I think I told you this today, basically they pay, they pay residential, um, they pay residents to rip up their lawn to make this, to save, to save water. All right, so now 404. This is talking about debates on who controls the water. You know, is the water supply, is that, a, is that a public thing? Or is that some way that, you know, I own the lake, so the government has to pay me to take that water to give to its citizens. Is it now a federally owned thing or is it a locally owned thing? Like who controls that? So it's subsidized or not. You know, basically give like kind of kickbacks per se. So we're trending better than most people talk about, luckily which again kind of goes back to that 
that um, cornucopian kind of optimism, luckily. All right, now this water disputes could cause major conflict in the future. It's like we saw in the movie, The Dirt, the movie, how pe basically people are causing wars and fighting over quality dirt. It's the same way with water. If we start running out of water, people are going to start fighting about it. All right, leave some questions. So that way we have stuff to talk about.